In 2004, I co-directed a no-budget kung fu comedy web series with Douglas R. Tenaple. So you write this one version of it, then when you do guerrilla filmmaking, you have to change everything according to what you have access to. Number of cameras, number of sets, number of actors that show up that day. You're ruining the illusion. Yeah, man. It was one of the earliest web series to exist. Really ham toward camera. You could break each of these shots down, and that was what really started getting me to think, like, I could actually do that. Will you stop doing that? It unexpectedly became a cult phenomenon. I'm supposed to be breathing oxygen! I'm supposed to be breathing oxygen! Inspired a generation of young stunt people and martial artists, and opened a path that took me from living and working on an almond farm to becoming an Emmy-nominated motion picture editor. And this is the story of how it happened. This is the story of Sock Baby. I've been into movies since I was very little. Uh, my parents introduced me to Ghostbusters, I think, when I was, like, a baby. Uh, and I used to watch that movie from, like, the age of, like, five to ten years old and actually dream about making movies. And, like, a lot of other guys like me, I spent a lot of that time period making, you know, like little stop motion movies with my toys, you know, things like that. But it wasn't until into the mid 90s to 2000s that I started to pick up this, uh, this martial art inspiration. Any kid my age grew up surrounded by, you know, all this revolutionary media in, you know, in the early 80s, there was all kinds of ninja stuff. There was all kinds of kung fu stuff. But none of it really had, like, the Hong Kong style. Like, we hadn't been introduced to that yet. Like, the pacing of the Hong Kong style and the speed and the framing and just the overall serious treatment that martial art got in Hong Kong. Uh, that started to change for me a little bit when Steve Norrington's Blade came out. That had a little bit more of... Uh, sort of the speed and the pacing and just the, the overall kind of attention to detail that Hong Kong cinema had it wasn't quite there yet. Uh, by the time that The Matrix came out in 1999, I was really seeing something that was changing the way that I was looking at action movies. I know Kung Fu. My favorite action movies were like, you know, the Mad Max films and Terminator 2, things like that. Things that were just like kind of out of my reach as far as technique and stunts. I saw The Matrix and I started realizing you could break each of these shots down and there were only about three or four moves in each shot. And that was what really started getting me to think like, you know, I could, I could actually do that. That became to me sort of a bridge into action cinema that I didn't have before. I could learn these things myself. All I would need was my own body and my own determination. And I could do something that could compare on some level with like Hollywood cinema. I learned martial art. I got into the shape I needed to be in. I became flexible enough. I learned the movements and I studied uh, Hong Kong cinema and I started trying to pull those things off, trying to understand how they were done. So my friends and I, we did a lot of experimentation. Dang it! <laughs> I did produce some examples in those early days, around 2000, 2001, 2002. Uh, that were pretty impressive. In 2003, there was this ska band that I had liked for a few years, and they released an album called The End Is Near. It was put out there like it was going to be their last album, so I had to have it, of course. I didn't have access to the internet, so my friend Ural uh, helped me buy a copy on on the internet. Uh, when I got the CD, I realized that the cover had this very like volumetric kind of 3D looking painting. And I was really curious about who did that. Of course, I opened it up 
And the same artist had done the artwork throughout the entire CD booklet and packaging. And I was looking through the credits on the album, and he actually had his email address on there. And his, his name was Douglas Tenaple. Uh, and of course, it didn't take me long to figure out that this guy was uh, the creator of you know some cartoons and video games that I had known about when I was younger, like Earthworm Jim is the big one that everybody talks about. Of course, there was an Earthworm Jim cartoon, and there's a cartoon called Project Geeker that he had made, and a video game called The Neverhood. It was a claymation video game. So I decided, you know, to just go out on a limb and just send this guy an email. And I sent him some footage from an experimental martial art film that I had made in like 2000. The story of this thing was very crude, but the martial arts scenes were pretty good. I emailed him back saying, hey, you want to do something together? And he said, yeah. I thought that was pretty cool, you know, because this guy had just sold the movie rights to a comic book that he had just put out, and uh, he was involved with TV and video games and all this stuff. Before I can even respond to his email, he sends me a script for a short that was later to become Sock Baby. It was a very different script from what we ended up with on screen, but a lot of the elements were there that ended up going into the second and third parts. You know, I, I tend to tell classic heroes journey stories and um they kind of write themselves you always start with the hero who you know he's like destined to go on this journey um so you write this this uh this one version of it and then when you do guerrilla filmmaking you have to change everything according to the limitations of you know what you have access to number of cameras number of sets number of actors that show up that day and we change accordingly. You kind of rewrite on the spot. Whatever's funny, whatever works at the time is what we usually go with. Oh, and we export everything to Korea and they actually make the whole thing and send it back to us. <laughs> Stuff started to unfold very quickly after that. We refined the script. Doug sent us a lineup of character sketches that we used to start putting together costumes. And we were able to find like Ronnie's costume at a thrift store, my dad made his medallion out of a piece of wood, and Berger's costume came together really quickly, almost exactly like it was on the drawing. We scheduled a meeting with Doug. Doug lived in L.A., and of course we lived 300 miles north in a little town called Houston. So we met half, more or less halfway in Bakersfield uh, at a Denny's. At that Denny's, a lot of magical things happened. Um, I showed Doug the Kung Fu previs that I had worked out with Ural in a gymnasium at a church in Houston, California, that ends up being the fight scene in the first installment of Sock Baby. You can see there is some difference, uh, you know, for example, this is only the first half of the fight scene that appears in the first episode of Sock Baby. Um, and then you can see that little thing I do at the end, that, that sort of flip that I do where I do the kick and all this. When we were on set filming Sock Baby, it was impossible to do that move in the suit. So it ends up not being in the movie. And of course, the second half of the fight scene involved this whole thing that Doug wanted to do which is uh, Ronnie's necklace stretches out and it becomes sort of like a meteor hammer. I had no idea how to do that. So I didn't do that in the previs. We figured it out later and it's still, you know, I don't know how good it is, but I tried my best. While we were at that Denny's uh, in Bakersfield, we did a script read through. Uh, we worked out who was gonna play what character. That's where it came down to me playing Ronnie. Um, we also figured out Ronnie's voice. Um, I was reading the script in the middle of this crowded Denny's and I, the, the voice was just a voice I used to do 
just to make my friends laugh. There's just an angry, yelling man. So what? <laughs> At the end of that meeting, Doug handed us $300 in cash, which is the, you know, the budget for this thing. We set about finishing up the preparations uh, in the weeks leading up. I actually had to build Berger's hand uh, and I built it completely out of cardboard. And uh, I just did that in my room at night. And it looked very close to what was in Doug's drawing. And of course, Justin had to make Berger's shoes. On some summer morning in the middle of 2003, Doug showed up at Justin's house uh, and we started filming Sock Baby. And I remember being ri ridiculously nervous for some reason. Um, I had never had anyone else come in from the outside and be a part of what I was doing, particularly with martial arts stuff. I was really used to working with Justin and Ben and people really close to, to our film company. But having someone coming, out, coming in from the outside, I, I was worried, you know, I was like, can I shoot this fight scene in one day? And am I, am I in good enough shape? Am I, you know, things like that. It was silly because it was just really a very small, like back, backyard project, but just really different from anything I was used to. So yeah, we filmed the scenes with uh, Ber Berger and Ronnie inside the house when Ronnie first comes in and he's like, Hello, we getting food or what? Hello, we gotta take care of suck, baby. We shot that with Doug there and Doug was puppeteering uh, the sock baby and it's actually his voice in that scene. Hey, sock baby, you wanna food up with us or what? What food? Ah, you see? If I remember right, I think Doug and Cody were laying on the floor, you know, pushing the door. Then we shot uh, what ended up being the first half of the fight scene. And the reason for that is I still hadn't figured out this this meteor hammer chain weapon thing. I mean, I, I was like, I didn't, I'm, you know, I'm not a Shaolin monk or anything. I hadn't quite figured out how to, how to do that or at least do it well enough to where we could fake it on camera. As we're finishing this thing up, Doug starts talking about what his goals are for the project, which of course I've never thought about. Justin and Ben and I used to make a lot of weird little projects and we would just show them either at like a festival somewhere and just scandalize the audience or we'd just show them to our friends or our family and freak them out because it was always really weird. But Doug really wanted to enter the first Sock Baby short into an online competition called Channel 101, founded by Dan Harmon and Rob Schraub. Hey, same car! Hey, same car! I had no idea what to think of this. I didn't understand uh, the idea of putting a film on the internet. I, I didn't have access to the internet at home. Video was really hard. You couldn't stream video. Uh, I remember at the time we downloaded the Hellboy trailer and it took all day. I didn't understand the internet at all going by the name of DJ Groove Mush to do the music. Justin Ridge is himself a great animator and a great animation director. He's directed a bunch of Star Wars animated stuff. He, he, was, he worked on Avatar The Last Airbender. Uh, amazing guy, but also does this kind of funky sample-based disco hip-hop like stuff. So Justin Ridge produced this really cool original funk score for Sock Baby. You know, again, my technical skills at the time were nearly non-existent. I, I had good, some decent skills with martial art choreography, timing for martial arts. I was pretty decent at editing that stuff together, but as far as camera and sound went, I think my philosophy when I was putting the sound effects together for the fight was that, it, you know, the louder the better. So everything is blown out, like everything is peaking. Like anytime there's sound, it's like all in the red. But we finally did get to the point where Sock Baby was going to play at Channel 101. And the way that Channel 101 worked, there was actually a live screening in Los Angeles. And the live audience would vote on five shows that would stay in circulation. And those would be online as the five syndicated shows. And then one month, you know, the next month, those shows would have a new episode and they would be pitted against one another and against new shows. So they could either stay in or get voted out. 
Justin and I went to Los Angeles and went to the live screening and uh, it, was, it was really surreal. You know, I'd never been involved, involved with anything like that. A, a lot of people from the comedy scene in LA were there. I remember like Drew Carey was sitting like two rows over from me on this side and like Shannon Elizabeth was two rows over on this side. Dan Harmon, who of course went on to create Community and Rick and Morty, uh, came up to us and gave us this huge compliment about the fight sequence and all this stuff. And yeah, the whole thing was really surreal. And of course, and we went home. Of course, we found out we were voted in. We beat out a show that had Jack Black in it. Of course, at the end of this, you know, Doug is like, okay, now we have one month to make the next episode. <laughs> ¶¶ 